thank you for standing by. Today's conference will begin momentarily. You will hear music until that time. Again, today's conference will begin momentarily. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Sarah Frazier. Thank you. You may begin. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining today's media teleconference. I'm Sarah Frazier with NASA's Office of Communications. In the next couple weeks, a new CubeSat mission is going to launch to the moon. Capstone will be the first spacecraft to fly in a near rectilinear halo orbit, the orbit intended for NASA's gateway. Capstone is short for Swift Lunar Autonomous Position System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. In addition to flying the near rectilinear halo orbit, Capstone carries two technology demonstrations. So here today to talk more about the mission objectives, the spacecraft at launch, and the mission's connection to Gateway are Chris Baker, Small Spacecraft Technology Program Executive in NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, Brad Cheatham, Advanced Space CEO and Principal Investigator for Capstone, Peter Beck, Rocket Lab Founder and CEO, Mark Bell, Terran Orbital Co-Founder, Chairman and CEO, Nujun Baranci, Chief of the Exploration Mission Planning Office at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. We'll start with opening comments from these speakers and then open it up to you for questions. To get into the question queue, as Danielle said, you will press star one on your phone. So to open it up, we will first hear from Chris Baker. All right, thank you. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to Capstone's upcoming launch um, as early as June 6th from New Zealand. 
Uh, as you heard, Capstone is the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, and it will be launching uh, to uh, deliver the first spacecraft to demonstrate the unique uh, lunar orbit intended for NASA's gateway. Uh, the 12U CubeSat will enter into the near rectilinear halo orbit to uh, verify the dynamics and gain operational knowledge of this beneficial but challenging orbit. Uh, Capstone is a rapid, low-cost, risk-tolerant demonstration that will also test multiple new capabilities with the intent to help lay a foundation for future small spacecraft missions and uh, commercial support of missions beyond Earth. Uh, Capstone is built around a uh, firm fixed price, small business, innovative research contract. Uh, the spacecraft is owned um, and operated by our commercial partners. Um, the mission has its roots in small businesses and in the U.S. government's uh, small business programs uh, with multiple partners, including Advanced Space, uh, Tyvek Nanosatellite Systems, uh, part of Terran Orbital, Stellar Exploration, uh, Tethers Unlimited, uh, and Rocket Lab, uh, all having been the recipients of current or prior small business innovation research awards. So uh, beyond our support uh, of the Artemis program, uh, part of what makes this mission uh, compelling from, from my perspective is, is how it is pushing forward our desire to increase the pace of space exploration, uh, the expansion of commercial space capabilities, uh, helping support not just our uh, major uh, human exploration program, but also helping expand uh, the capability of small missions to reach new destinations and operate in challenging new environments. So, uh, looking forward to answering your questions uh, today. Great. Thank you, Chris. So next we'll go to Brad from Advanced Space. Great. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for, for being on today. I'm very excited as we are, are getting uh, approaching launch here for the Capstone mission. I'm so happy to be here and, and share with you our perspective and answer your questions. Uh, I'd first also like to start by, by thanking Chris and his team at the Small Spacecraft Technology Program. Uh, this whole endeavor is, is, is critically dependent on, on the help they've provided, uh, and so we appreciate that. Uh, and i also like to highlight that we're really proud uh, at advanced space of the team that, that is supporting this mission, which is truly one mission team, including NASA, including our other industry partners and other, other government partners. And, and really just to highlight the breadth of that involvement, and Chris touched on this somewhat, um, certainly the small spacecraft technology program is based in the space technology mission directorate, but the technology itself that it's enabling, a key enabling technology for this mission, I'll talk about in a minute, really initially started as a project in the science mission directorate. Uh, and then on our path to getting Capstone to where we are today was directly enabled and enhanced by support from the Exploration uh, Mission Directorate. And so really it's been, I think, a, a broad uh, NASA effort to, to get us to where we are today, and we're very grateful for that. And then also more specifically, we want to be really clear that, that the NASA centers have, have been really heavily involved. Our, our program office at NASA Ames has been key day to day in how we've operated this. Uh, we have partners at NASA Goddard who are supporting some of our technology demonstrations, uh, without which we can't demonstrate some of the key technologies, and their support has been critical and very helpful. Uh, ongoing and active collaborations with the Johnson Space Center, and specifically the Gateway Program Office, which has provided inputs and, and received benefits from the, the work we've already been doing on Capstone, uh, certainly NASA headquarters, and, and also the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in many different ways has been uh, key to getting us to where we are today. And so as, as we think as a small business, uh, the, that has been entrusted with this really important, critical pathfinding mission in Capstone. Uh, we think it's really important to recognize that that's that's really a team effort, uh, that, and all those folks at those different organizations have have gotten us here, and, and we wouldn't have been here without them. Um, just to talk a little bit more about the mission, I'm, I'm grateful that that the prior two speakers have spelled out the acronym because I, I have to do that all the time. Uh, but the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. That's the capstone mission. Uh, the way I like to, to dive into those details a little more as we sort of think about it is two two key activities. The first is the, the first four letters of the acronym, the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System. And this is an advanced lunar navigation capability uh, that here at Advanced Space has been in development for several years. Uh, we really see this as a foundation for future growth of operations at the moon. And, and supporting Capstone has really gotten this system ready for flight. Uh, we'll be demonstrating it on the upcoming flight and also has matured several different capabilities through that process. We've learned a lot uh, that we think will improve this system going into the future to enable future missions of all types and kinds uh, at the moon. 
The second four letters of the acronym, the Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, um, this is sort of the second key for us, which is really we are focused here on demonstrating the ability to operate in these highly beneficial but also very unique orbits at the moon. Uh, as was mentioned, our target orbit is a near rectilinear halo orbit, uh, which is part of a, a three-body Earth-Moon orbit family, uh, and there's other missions that have done that before. But it's really a capability um, that has only been demonstrated in, in the previous uh, mission, an Artemis mission, not to be confused by the, the Artemis program uh, by NASA and has been flown by the Chinese space program. And so by flying Capstone there in the, in the coming uh, you know, weeks and months, we'll be the only the third organization to demonstrate the ability to fly in these very unique and very beneficial orbits. And this is fundamentally an operational capability um, that we have demonstrated getting ready for launch, working with our partners at the Turn Orbital, um, but it's also a capability um, that has yielded benefits that have already fed out to support other programs and other activities. So something we're very proud of, uh, of getting to is, is having that system, the very unique system, ready to go. And so that, that's how, how we look at the mission as, as we approach uh, launch. We're very excited. Um, and I'll just sort of end here and by saying I very much look forward to your questions. And I also we're extremely grateful here at Advanced Space to have uh, great partners, many of them on this call, others not, uh, that have delivered on this mission uh, for NASA and, and for our nation. So thank you. Thanks, Brad. I'm now going to pass it to Mark from Terran Orbital. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, first, I want to thank Chris Baker and the Small Spacecraft Technology Program and Brad from Advanced Space for entrusting us uh, with, the, with the build of the satellite. Uh, we're proud of our 12 u spacecraft we designed, uh, offering fully redundant dual string bus, which is a new level of mission assurance in a small set. Uh, we will be operating the satellites out of our mock in Irvine, California, utilizing NASA's deep space, tech, deep space network. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, it was a great team to work with, and we thank everybody for all the support and all the confidence they had in us in uh, delivering, uh, delivering the satellite. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Sarah. And Mark, uh, this is Chris. Uh, I just also wanted to thank you for, uh, you know, the support of the three uh, three spacecraft uh, we currently have with you on the Transporter 5 uh, launch, which is ongoing right now. So uh, thanks uh, thanks to your team for uh, the work on PTD3 and, and CPOD, and uh, looking forward to seeing those deployed here shortly and uh, getting in operation. So uh, thank you, uh, obviously, for Capstone, but thank you for those as well, and uh, looking forward to those, those operations as well soon. Thank you, Chris, and we really appreciate the trust NASA has given in us uh, into doing all these amazing programs and look forward to many more in the future. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, now we'll hear from Peter from Rocket Lab. Yeah, thanks very much, Sarah. And, and, and you know, echo all my colleagues here, a huge thanks to NASA and, and, and the whole team. I mean, it, it really was a whole team effort, and, and doing a mission like this is, is, is no easy task. But I guess what, what I'm most excited about is, is we're, we're really, you know, from, from Rocket Lab's perspective at least, bringing a new capability to go very far and do exciting things in deep space, you know, in, in a, at a budget and in, in a timeline that, that we've never really seen before. I mean, uh, a small dedicated launch to the moon uh, is, is, is pretty phenomenal. And, you know, there's been a lot of new capabilities that have been created uh, to enable this mission. And, um, you know, the, the lunar photon is, is an incredibly high energy upper stage that, um, that, that, uh, that we've spent a long time uh, developing, so we, we're we're super excited to see it on the pad, and uh, and and can't can't wait to uh, to get a safe launch and uh, and off to the moon. Thanks, Peter. All right, I'll bring it back to NASA and pass it to Nuju to talk about Capstone's connection to Gateway. Thank you, and good afternoon. Yeah, this mission is exciting milestone for so many aspects of NASA's Artemis mission. It goes without saying that we view the Capstone mission as a whole as a valuable precursor, not just for Gateway, um, which we talk a lot about for Capstone, but also for Orion and the human landing system in the larger architecture. Capstone will gather important data on the near rectilinear halo orbit, or NRHO, and this is viewed as the orbit for Gateway and the vehicles in our, it will interact with. So NRHO will undergird the success of, of not just Gateway, but many aspects of the Artemis mission. And that's for many reasons. NRHO enables global lunar access, um, in particular the South Pole, which is what we're interested in for the Artemis uh, campaign. 
It's highly fuel efficient, especially when compared to other types of orbits around the moon. NRHO will give a gateway a continuous line of sight or view of Earth, so we get uninterrupted communication between the Earth and the moon. And as the gateway vehicle travels in deep space, its presence opens up uh, a lot of opportunities for radiation experience and the greater um, analysis of space weather on people and instruments for future exploration. So the benefits of NRHO are clear, and we're excited to see Capstone test and validate this orbit for the first time. Uh, Artemis teams like Gateway and Orion will use the data from Capstone to validate our models, which will be important for operations and planning for the future missions. The NASA and advanced space teams have been collaborating very closely, for instance, working as one team on Gateway's mission design and trajectory, and there's been a lot of sharing back and forth of data and other activities. So it's been a very fruitful collaboration and echoing the sentiments of everyone else on the call. Um, we're excited to see Capstone ready to fly and that all of the Artemis teams are excited to watch it happen. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're ready to start our Q&A now. So I will turn it over to Danielle to give those instructions and start opening up lines. Thank you. As we begin the question and answer session, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please dial star one and record your name when prompted. Your name is just required so we can introduce your question. Our first question today comes from Elizabeth Howell. Your line is now open. Thanks for your time, everyone. This is probably from for Bradley. Can you give me a sense about how you're going to be assessing success for this particular orbit and also any kinds of lessons learned you might have imported from those two other missions, the Chinese one and the other Artemis? Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I'll start with the, the second uh, part of that question and I'll work back to the first one. So um, we have learned a lot from the Artemis mission uh, and, and a lot of that honestly has, has been personal uh, transfer, transfer of knowledge. Uh, as I was really fortunate uh, over a decade ago to be working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center supporting that mission. And that, in fact, inspired what I went to, on to do in, in grad school for my PhD. And so uh, personally, that mission sort of started the, the passion that I had for these unique orbits um, that really led to the growth of advanced space and ultimately the, the capstone mission. So we certainly uh, learned a lot about um, technically from that program about what some of the, the challenges are and of operating in these orbits. Uh, and and that, that fed a lot of research and work that, that happened in the intervening years uh, that we'll now be demonstrating out for, for the capstone mission uh, coming up here. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the first part of your question, uh, in, in, in terms of quantifying success, we have uh, several measurable objectives um, that we've identified from, from day one working with, with the NASA team. Um, a lot of those get to uh, val validating uh, the predicted fuel usage, uh, validating the performance on uh, both ground navigation, uh, so predicted versus reality, uh, as well as uh, the operation or the demonstration of our system or autonomous positioning system. A key part of that is uh, we have a great idea how that works in a lab here in Denver. We, we need to figure out how it works at, uh, you know, on a spacecraft at the moon. And there's a lot of nuance of, of those signals. Um, closing a cross link between the Capstone spacecraft and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, orbiter a, a system that certainly was not designed to do this experiment, but we've been working with the NASA Goddard team to be able to do this experiment. That, uh, that activity already has yielded tremendous learning uh, on what those future systems will need to be like so that we can have spacecraft at the moon talking to each other. And ultimately during Capstone, we'll learn a lot about that signal performance and the, uh, the, the performance of the CAP system at the moon. Uh, hopefully that, that addressed your questions, uh, and, and, but happy to follow up if there is one. Excellent, thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please dial star one. And when you ask your question, please state your outlet. Our next question comes from Tim Fernholz. Your line is now open. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Tim Fernholz from Quartz. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I think I understand the benefits of this new orbit uh, to NASA's plans, but I'm not sure I understand the challenges. Could you talk a little bit about what makes an orbit like this challenging for a spacecraft to get to and maybe compare it to either the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's uh, positioning or another spacecraft in orbit so we can sort of understand uh, both the costs and the benefits. Thank you. Brad, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah, thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, and I think maybe I'll start, you mentioned at one point, you know, 
getting to the orbit. And I think that's a key benefit um, of, of the near to linear halo orbit is that it is accessible. And so I want to pull on that thread first because the whole mission capstone from day one when it was first envisioned is entirely enabled by this benefit of the NRHO, which is that we can use something called a ballistic lunar transfer um, to very efficiently get into this orbit, this NRHO. Um, and, and to compare that, uh, our uh, approach to get there is on the order of, you know, tens of meters per second of fuel required. And, and if we were to do a direct transfer uh, to a low lunar orbit or to even a direct transfer to, to these type of three-body orbits, we'd be talking about hundreds of meters per second of fuel. So it's a basically an order of magnitude more efficient. Um, and that is a, a key enabler for, uh, for Capstone um, because from the beginning, we were looking at a, a small spacecraft. Um, and so in order to be able to do this mission, we had to know how to get there efficiently. And that's something that we've, we've spent a lot of time developing those capabilities. And what those capabilities look like to get to the root of your question is really having the ability to design these transfers which change uh, day to day and, and month to month and there, there's a lot of availability but they're not always the same and so we had to develop the tools to be able to uh, provide to rocket lab a launch uh, target for them to to be able to to inject us on as a spacecraft to be able to evaluate the environments and to evaluate the systems that are going to fly on the on the, the spacecraft itself during that transfer and then when we get to the orbit to get i think to the root of your question a lot of what we're learning is, is about the operational realities of, of this type of, of flight. And what that means is we have to know how much ground tracking do we need to do to get an estimate of the spacecraft orbit that is sufficient to maintain the orbit doing station keeping maneuvers about once a week. Um, and that really gets to some of these things of how do we get that done more efficiently and are there ways where we can automate some of that navigation on the ground and some of that maneuver design activity on the ground so that the operational burden of the mission is reduced. Uh, comparing, an, comparing an NRHO to something like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, one of the big differences from a math perspective, from a physics perspective, is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is flying much lower to the moon and effectively is in you know, an orbit about the moon is really, from a systems perspective, has to worry about the moon's gravity and, 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 and being there. One of the challenges that we get for having such an accessible orbit in an NRHO is that the NRHO is influenced by both the Earth and the Moon. And for, we'll say the orbit's about seven days, for about six days, it's really primarily uh, influenced by the Earth. And then for a day or so, it's primarily influenced by the Moon. And so that that combination of two bodies and the, the, the sort of uh, evolution over a, a, a seven day orbit of, of which is more dominant, which is more impactful, that really drives some of those operational complexities. Hopefully that got to the root of your question. If it didn't, happy to do a follow-up. No, I think so. So basically it's the complexity of the various sort of arithmetic you have to do to figure out the precise course because the orbit is changing due to the, the three bodies affecting it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, uh, so this is Chris Baker. I'm going to add, add a little bit more on, on to that. So, you know, as, as Brad was saying, you know, these are, you know, these, these are multi-body orbits. Um, you know, one way to, another way to talk about, uh, you know, the transfer is, you know, one way it's referred to is, is a uh, gravity manifold trajectory. You're using uh, the pull of, of multiple different bodies. And then once you're in that near rectilinear halo orbit, you, you have the benefit of, um, you know, a lower energy entering into uh, that from, from kind of an Earth, Earth frame of reference and the lower energy leaving it to get to the um, get to the lunar surface, and that's because you've got this pull from both uh, both the Earth and Moon, as, as Brad was just discussing. Um, so it has the be benefit of the uh, of the low energy to get into and the low energy to get out of, but you are then now kind of riding this balance point between the gravitational pull of the Earth and the gravitational pull of the Moon, and and that's you know as was just said, that's what gets into that kind of complexity of making sure. Uh, you, you know how how to stay in that, how much energy it's going to take to stay in that balance uh, balance point, um, and get that kind of operational experience um, before we go and do that with Gateway. Our next question comes from Marsha. Me? Can you hear me? Hi, Marsha. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned two previous spacecraft in this orbit. When were those 
Uh, when were those launched, and have you are, do either of those missions help you in your planning for this one? And and why why is it taking so long to get to the moon? Um, you know, a couple day trip in Apollo. So I'm just trying to. Is it because of this uh, strange orbit you have to get into? Is that the reason for taking three months? I think I read online. Thanks. Uh, so, so this is Chris Baker. I'll, I'll address the first part of that, and then probably uh, pass it back uh, back to Brad um, to uh, to discuss the uh, more technical details of the orbital mechanics. But, um, you know, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the comment you made earlier about the, the two previous uh, spacecraft uh, that was in reference to operating in three body orbits, not the uh, near rectilinear or halo orbit in particular. So, this will be the first spacecraft to enter into and operate in uh, that near rectilinear halo orbit. And the short version to this, the second half of your question is uh, yes, it is because we're using that low energy trajectory and we're using the, the pull uh, from the sun uh, to help us get to the moon that, that increases that timeline. Uh, it's, it's a much a more efficient transfer in terms of fuel, fuel usage, but it, it trades that efficiency uh, for time. And then, uh, Brad, if you want to elaborate on. Um, uh, the ins and outs of the orbital mechanics there, please, please do so. Absolutely, yeah. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, great question. And so, yeah, as Chris was mentioning, the the key there is really leveraging the the sun's gravity in this case to more efficiently get to the moon, uh, which enabled the whole thing. Uh, as part of your question was about the Artemis mission, uh, and, and I may have misspoke. There's only two missions that have flown this. The Artemis mission flew two relatively small spacecraft uh, into in these Earth Moon three body orbits, as Chris uh, clarified, not. Uh, near rectilinear halo orbits, but a different type of three-body orbit that was done uh, in like the 2009 time frame. I'm uh, pull it for you. I'm sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, and then the the Chinese uh, space agency is actually currently operating in a, a Earth Moon L2 orbit with a, a relay uh, capability for their far side lander. Um, so that, that that's sort of the the context. Um, and then. Um, I think there was another part of your question, and I apologize. Could you uh, refresh my memory of, of what the other part of your question was? Well, it, I was just wondering why it takes so long to get there, and you sort of answered that. Um, yeah, and thank you for clarifying it. When I first heard you say, you know, two previous spacecraft, I, I was thinking the same orbit. Um, you, no, you answered that. Thank you. And if I might have another question on the cost, um, I saw two contracts listed online, launch about $10 million and capstone $13.7 million. Are those good numbers to use for the mission cost? Uh, so, so this is Chris Baker. So the uh, publicly uh, available uh, values are, are the total of the, of the two contracts. The, the launch uh, launch contract cost is is still accurate. That's 19.95. Um, the uh, mission cost uh, contract has uh, has grown a bit. Uh, it is now 19.98. Thank you. And just to clarify, I I, I think I said 9.95 for the launch, but. Um, let me verify that I said that correctly. For launch cost, public value is $9.95 million, and the mission cost is $19.98 million. Apologies if I misspoke there. Thank you very much. Indeed, I just wanted to clarify one piece, too, on the, the duration Capstone is using to get there is the three months it's because of the ballistic lunar transfer, um, and that's to make it a low cost in terms of performance or fuel. Um, when we travel to this orbit with the crew in Artemis, it would be as few as five days, potentially up to 10, which is really based around rendezvousing with like, the gateway if it's the Orion vehicle. So very different um, travel times, whether we're traveling with crew or cargo type uh, a satellite. So um, more of five day type entry uh, for crew in the future. Yeah, thank you, Niju. This is Brad. I just also wanted to add on. Um, you, you kind of mentioned in your question that the the timing uh, is, is is vague in terms of how long that duration of that transfer is. Sorry, that's the second part of the question I was going to answer. I mean, I just wanted to explain that. Um, so, one of the benefits of the the transfer approach that we're using for Capstone is that uh, no matter which day we launch in the upcoming window, uh, we will arrive at the same day. It's actually October 15th uh, of this year. Um, and so, if if you imagine if we launch, you know. Day one, it's, it's one transfer, and if we launch during the window, it becomes a shorter transfer. And so that, that we've gotten some questions about that in the past, and it's it's really a, a, actually a feature of the approach um, because one of the key things of the specific uh, operational NRHO we'll be flying is that this is a eclipse-free NRHO, so we'll 
it's designed to avoid uh, eclipses from the Earth, which is a very important consideration. And so uh, that's something that is sometimes transfer duration changes depending on the day we launch. But in this window, we will always arrive uh, on October 15th. Uh, it's about 1.30 in the morning mountain time. Uh, and so all of our operational teams here and at Darren Orbital will be uh, working the night shift to be to be ready to execute that that activity. Uh, but I just wanted to get to the duration of, of why it's sort of the, the answer to the duration is it sort of it depends. So sorry for that ambiguity. Our next question comes from Irene Quat. Your line is now open. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, I was just curious about the nominal mission duration um, and uh, what, why, uh, why there was that cost growth in the spacecraft cost. And then uh, secondly, about um, just trying to understand, too, if this, is, if this data is considered essential or just nice to have ahead of the uh, Gateway and the Artemis uh, program. Thanks. Sure, thanks. So the uh, the, the mission um, nominally, um, you know, up to up to 18 months, uh, six six month uh, kind of baseline, and then up to 18 months um, uh, operation. Uh, the uh, uh, short answer on the question of the cost growth um, is uh, there were uh, schedule impacts uh, outside the scope of uh, the original firm fixed price contract, um, and uh, those schedule impacts resulted um, in uh, in that, that increased uh, increased growth in um, in the overall cost of, of the mission, um, and um, probably a uh, best person to answer the uh, the um, data question maybe over to Najib. Yes, thank you. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, uh, we have full plans that we could move forward with Gateway and really all of the Artemis missions that we'll use in our HO. This data would be really valuable to help refine models, maybe um, find efficiencies. Uh, but it's not necessary or required to proceed. So always good to get more data and improve our modeling, but we have full confidence in the data that will be happening either way. Thank you. And, and this is Brad. If I can just add to that, thank you, uh, Najud, for that. I think the other thing to highlight that I think is important is that, uh, and Najud referred to this earlier, we're already, I'd say Kepson is already yielding benefits uh, to that, to the to the planning and the 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 development efforts for, for Gateway and for Artemis. And so our, just to be super clear, our team is working day, day to day with the team at JSC uh, to evaluate, you know, different things that, that the Gateway team is learning that we can in incorporate and different things we're learning that they can incorporate already. And so I think that's an, just an important note that, that this is already, I think, yielded value and, and operationally, at least as, as our teams have been collaborating through the development effort. Our next question comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Jeff, your line is now open. Uh, good afternoon. Question for uh, Peter Beck. Uh, just curious, you know, if there are any special challenges or obstacles you had to overcome in the development of the lunar photon system to send capstone to the moon, and do you see any applicability of this technology for other missions, uh, other applications beyond this particular mission? Thanks. Yeah, great, great question, Jeff. Uh, tremendous amount of, of new technologies developed, uh, including an, an entirely new propulsion system called Hypercurry. Uh, you know, generally, uh, small propulsion systems with really high ISP is, is, a, is a difficult thing to master. Um, you know, the, the propulsion system Hypercurry is a 320-second back ISP, you know, full hypergolf storable. Um, so that, that, was, that was a tremendous amount of work. And then, you know, on, on the vehicle itself, um, you know, I think the, the, the largest lift we've done to date is around about 200 kg, um, and this, this flight is in excess of 300 kg. Um, so, uh, so, so lots of, lots of new developments, um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, probably one of the most exciting things is, is to kind of to your point, is that this is a, a really, really high-performance, high-delta V upper stage that, that we can use you know, for, for Capstone, but, you know, it forms the basis of a mission to Venus and, uh, you know, a bunch of other, um, you know, potential programs that have that, that really high, um, you know, Delta V requirement in, in performance. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ramin Gabo with Wired. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. 
Um, I think this is a question for Brad Cheatham. Um, I was uh, um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the two uh, technology demonstrations. I, I, it sounded like there's a positioning system and a navigation system, um, especially if one of these uh, are, are particularly new that you're testing out here. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Uh, great question, and thanks for the for poking at that. Um, so I, I, the first key for us is the system or autonomous positioning system or CAPS, um, and that in and of itself is an architecture uh, which will provide uh, spacecraft operating in the Earth-Moon system or at the moon with knowledge of where that spacecraft is. And so that is something certainly on the ground we take for granted. We have a GPS system to give us that information beyond Earth orbit into the moon and beyond. That information is traditionally uh, collected using ground-based tracking where ground stations stock the satellite and the ground figures out where the satellite is. So one of the key enablers for CAPS as we see it, is, is providing that location information to a satellite onboard the satellite. And so that will be uh, the core of, of the technology demonstration for onboard activities. Um, in that experiment or in that, that, that technology mindset, we'll be evaluating uh, data measurements that we'll be able to obtain by talking with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in low lunar orbit. From that communication with LRO, we'll get uh, uh, information on the, the distance and the time history of that distance between the two spacecraft, that will be used by the CAPS software to, to figure out where both spacecraft are. That's sort of the first, uh, the first key part of the demo. Another uh, thing that we added to the program was also the inclusion of a second data type, uh, which will utilize a, a chip scale atomic clock or a CSAC um, that will allow the spacecraft to listen to transmissions from the Earth and just from receiving that information, be able to provide another type of information that will feed uh, a positioning estimate for the spacecraft at the moon. So the core piece on the satellite is based around CAPS, the Cis Lunar Autonomous Positioning System. The second key piece, uh, and, and not necessarily in order of importance, but the second key piece I'll talk about is the ground technology, which, which I think you're alluding to, which is really to say the ability for a, a commercial company, in, in our case, to operate a satellite at the moon in these unique orbits. That in of itself is a whole other technology activity that we've been able to develop uh, and demonstrate as we've moved to launch. And so those are the two key pieces um, I think that you're, you're asking about. And so CAPS is really the onboard knowledge of where the satellite is and the, the ground-based uh, flight dynamic system, which is really sort of the mission unique uh, part of how to fly at the moon. And then just to be really clear, and I'm happy to hand it off if you'd like to talk about it more, uh, our partners at Terran Orbital will actually be the team sending the commands to the satellite and making sure that the rest of the satellite's working uh, besides just figuring out where it is and, and when it needs to do a maneuver. So I don't know if Mark uh, had anything else you wanted to add there. No, I think you pretty much covered it. Well, thank you. Unless you, have more, unless you have a more detailed question, happy to answer it. Yeah, actually, so this is Chris Baker. I'll, I'll add a little more on top of that, too. So, you, um, you know, Mark, uh, as he mentioned earlier, his team's uh, got, uh, you know, new technology on, on the spacecraft in terms of trying to increase the overall reliability. Uh, Pete uh, just uh, mentioned, you know, the new technology in the launch vehicle itself and the, you know, the, the interplanetary photon uh, that is supporting not just this mission, but also potentially laying the groundwork for uh, missions to Venus, missions to Mars. Uh, so in addition to the, you know, the experiments on board the spacecraft, I'd say the the overall mission is is a risk tolerant technology demonstration. This uh, capstone uh, at its core is a is a flight test, and it's a flight test of multiple capabilities. So we we have these uh, great onboard experiments, uh, but the capabilities I think we're demonstrating uh, are are well beyond uh, just uh, just those uh, you know very powerful things that uh, Brad was just talking about uh, extend to. Uh, you know, our, our spacecraft here, uh, built by our partners, uh, the launch vehicle, uh, built by uh, also by our other partners, uh, and then kind of the overall uh, mission mission capability that's uh, being brought to bear here. So uh, just the team at Advanced Space, uh, you know, Terran Orbital, Rocket Lab, Stellar Exploration, et cetera, have just done a, a fantastic job uh, putting a lot of new, uh, new technology and de-risking it uh, for this mission. Um, really looking forward to uh, how these all, how these systems all work, but just to emphasize, it is it is a flight test. It is a tech demo. So uh, we will we will learn things. We've already learned uh, learned things, and and the technology that's been developed for this mission, uh, we we hope will uh, go on to do great things in other missions as well.
Thank you. Our next question comes from Emily Speck with Fox Weather. Your line is now open. Hi, my question is for Peter Beck. Um, I believe I read that the lunar photon will continue on after separation for safe disposal. Where is that disposal orbit? And also, will data from this flight help with the future mission to Venus? Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, yeah. So, to answer the, the, the second part of your question first, uh, a, a, absolutely. Um, you know, this is, and I think as Chris mentioned, this really, you know, lays the groundwork for um, for future you know, deep space missions. Uh, you know, off uh, off Electron and, and and other platforms, and uh, you know the 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 team has worked um, you know together to try and um, to to really ensure that um, we you know the the end of life for the stage is is in a you know in, in a safe and disposed orbit, um, and some of that depends on um, propellant residuals um, to to what actual orbit we end up in. Um, you know, if we have uh, if we have you know a, a large amount of residuals, then um, We'll look to you know look look for various different orbits that, that you know that we can that we can park. Thank you. Our next question comes from Leonard David with Inside Outer Space. Your line is now open. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess for Brad, I, at some point I thought. Um, that the uh, capstone would have a camera on it. I don't know if that's the case today. And just uh, building on Jeff Faust's uh, question for Peter, um, it looks to me like what we're seeing here is a, you know, kind of a, a stepping stone approach to deep space exploration with uh, small payloads. And uh, clearly uh, Rocket Lab is very interested in follow-on missions, and, and to what degree uh, do we kind of uh, tip our cap to capstone uh, for, uh, for uh, making this new milestone capable? So I think the first half of that was for Brad. Yep, copy. Uh, thank, thank you, Leonard, for the question. I appreciate it. Good, good to hear from you. Um, yes, we, we do have a, a payload imager on board. Um, the, we're very excited to, to have the satellite out there and, and to see what we can collect with that imager. Uh, we haven't, uh, it hasn't come up today just because that isn't in and of itself tied to a technology demonstration. That's more of a, a you know, why would you go to the moon without a camera, right? So uh, we're looking forward to that, and we have ideas actually about how in that uh, sort of enhanced mission phase, after we've you know gotten through some of the core technology demonstrations, to really understand how that those optical uh, how optical data could inform uh, positioning at the moon, as well as uh, exploring other uses for that data. So certainly uh, that that imager is is in the satellite, is in is in New Zealand, and the spacecraft is fueled and, and ready to go, and that will be part of it. Uh, we just it's it's not uh, right now at the core of any of the technology uh, objectives. So thanks for the question. And uh, you know um, absolutely, Leonard. Like the, the, I think the tipping of the cap is, is is a great way to put it. I mean, uh, you know, on the outset of the project. Um, it, it looked, uh, you know, relative, simple, re simple, relatively simple um, to do. But you know, along the way, um, you know, we, we had to create entirely new technologies. Um, you know, the the hypercurry engine is is, is electric uh, pumped, and and uh, and and you know, it, it's an incredibly high um, mass fraction mass, mass fraction fraction stage. So uh, it, it forced us to do things that. Um, that you know uh, that we wouldn't have normally done, and as a result, I think you're exactly right. It's created the capability, um, and you know we, we're excited to see that capability used right throughout our solar system um, for doing these really uh, low cost um, and and you know high you know high value um, you know, missions. Thanks a lot. Our next question comes from Deanne Divis with Navigation Outlook. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. I'm very curious about the, the navigation technology and what it might be saying for future plans. Um, my understanding of what you're saying with the crosslink is there are the two satellites, Capstone and LRO, will be swapping data, basically, um, with Capstone getting data from LRO. But 
That suggests to me that the satellites know where they are relative to each other. If the goal is to not have to rely on the Earth, it seems like you would need some additional, some additional data points to say where a satellite is in 3D space. Am I, am I getting that right? Is there a plan for in, in, the, in the longer term? It's, I know it's just a test, but is there a plan to add additional data points from, say, satellites or the lunar surface to make all that work? Yes, uh, this is Brad. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, great question. Thank you. <clears throat> so just um, a couple of things to clarify. One uh, minor thing is that uh, in our crosslink with the Lunar Constant Orbiter, we're actually uh, – we're, we're going to, as a spacecraft, the capsule spacecraft will, will – will, imitate a ground station and will send a ranging tone to the lunar reconnaissance orbiter to so the, the, the LRO will turn around and send back to us. And so the, the baseline operation there um, from just a mechanics perspective is that they'll turn around the signal from that, the caps, capstone spacecraft using the cap software will be able to estimate both spacecraft. And, and your, your question is very astute um, that the, before we are able to do that, uh, we have to know where each of them are, at least within the beam width of their antenna, right, in order to be able to talk to each other. So that is a, a, great, a great point. And so that is one of, as we envision uh, the future of the system and the future of lunar operations, uh, which you touched on at the end of your question, uh, we have designed and architected CAPS from the beginning to be an expandable and an evolvable system. Uh, fundamentally, we want it to be like a peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer network where multiple spacecraft are having these uh, are able to exchange information to figure out where they are um, and that over time uh, that system will grow and grow the, the estimates will get better and better but certainly there is a initial uncertainty or initial knowledge of the spacecraft that you have to have to, to begin that process and, and really it's tied to the uh, beam beam width of the of the antennas that you're using uh, to talk to each other and that's another reason why we've added uh, for capstone, this chip scale atomic clock, uh, we call it the one-way uplink ranging, uh, because you can envision to get to that initial uh, knowledge of where the satellites are, uh, you can envision transmitting a broad beam from the ground to give you that initial uh, estimate before you hand off to the, the spacecraft to spacecraft communications. So it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, it's it, you've, uh, very astute uh, on the, the, the details there. And, and to, to really the bottom line is we see this as just the beginning of what we hope will be a much broader uh, network among satellites and among among uh, assets, both on the could be on the surface, could be in different orbits at, at the moon. Uh, but really, that's what the system has been architected uh, to do. So, thank you for the question. So, you could add assets on the surface to, you know, like some of the other systems I'm I'm familiar with, to to get get it down to a very accurate 3D location. A absolutely, yeah. And part of, part of the enabling uh, science, if you will, for Caps is that because the Earth moon uh, dynamics for these type of three-body orbits uh, is not symmetrical like an orbit just about the Earth or just about the moon would be. Um, those relative measurements in a theoretical orbit determination approach can actually yield absolute knowledge of where they are in space uh, because we don't have uh, uh, a symmetry with which to, to complicate the orbit determination approach. So, and, and the other part of the question, absolutely ground, uh, ground nodes can, will help uh, in the future, one of the key guiding philosophies as we've been developing this for several years has been to really try to focus on the minimum viable product, um, realizing that the, the systems that probably are in most need of uh, additional navigation support are probably the smaller missions to begin with, right? And so that, that's something where we see this as an enabler to more missions like Capstone. Um, and, and, and as there are assets on the surface, they will certainly, we, we, we would like them to be part of the network and, and, and make them part of the solution. Absolutely. Thank you. Very interesting. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please dial star one and record your name when prompted. Our next question comes from Jim McKenna with Aerospace Tech Review. Your line is now open. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. This is from Brad. Uh, you mentioned uh, the ability to avoid uh, an Earth eclipse. Uh, is the plan for this spacecraft to be in an orbit that has it always facing the Earth and rather than going behind the moon? 
And is that a capability that's uh, attributable to this distinct orbit? Absolutely, yes, Jim. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer that, and then I'll also uh, hand it over to Nizhu to see if there's anything general she'd like to add. But, but yes, to answer your question, what we'll be designing is a specific phase of the NRHO so that we are, are not in an eclipse from the Earth. Um, another key benefit, which I don't think we've talked about, uh, or if we have, uh, I'll reiterate it, is that this, this orbit, this, this unique orbit, is always in view of the Earth. Um, so we are never behind the moon as you look from the Earth. Um, and the phasing of the orbit itself, the first part of the, the response, is that we're also uh, timed so that we're never flying through the shadow of the Earth, as you can imagine, that uh, moves around the, the lunar distance. And so those are the, the two key things. Um, and, and the reason why I mentioned is because this is the uh, exact same approach that Gateway is taking. In fact, we are, are designing all of our capstone mission operations around the the orbit that is planned for gateway. So this gets to part of that operational experience. Um, and, and, and part of that gets to, as I mentioned earlier, um, the launch timing and the approach to get to the orbit uh, are very sensitive to that phasing. And so that's an approach that the ballistic transfer helps us address. Uh, but I also uh, want to hand it back over to Nishud and if there's anything else from a gateway perspective that she wants to add. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Um, yeah, so I'll note the, the specific resonance Brad is talking about is a 9-2 synodic resonance, which means for every two months, uh, we'll pass through nine orbits. So it's a very specific NRHO. There's actually a whole family of NRHOs, but we've chosen a very specific one for the Gateway and Artemis missions, which really avoids those Earth eclipses, which can be multiple hours in length. So to design vehicles to survive multiple hours of eclipsing um, would be far too challenging. Um, this doesn't mean that they will never see eclipsing because we will pass behind the moon when we're very close to the moon uh, every once in a while. Um, but those eclipses are, are less than 90 minutes. They're generally in the 70 or 80 minute range. But those are lunar eclipses, not Earth eclipsing. So as Brad discussed, right, this orbit was very carefully tailored um, to support the longer missions because you, we don't want to build vehicles out for those long Earth eclipsing, which would add a lot of performance really battery mass and power systems that you'd need as well as thermal systems. So um, if there's any follow-up, but yeah, this is, this is very important on the timing for this orbit. Great. Thing. We have no further questions in queue. So Sarah, back to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you joining the telecon. Um, in about an hour, you'll be able to listen to a replay of this teleconference by dialing 203-369-3272, and that replay will be available for 30 days. Um, there's also a YouTube stream currently embedded on nasa.gov slash live. So if you go to that page and check out the YouTube link, you can uh, listen to it there as well, and that'll be available forever. Um, and if you have need that information or have any follow-up questions or interview requests, you can reach out to Jarell Dodson, who you RSVP to, or to me, Sarah Frazier at sarah.frazier at nasa.gov. That's S-A-R-A-H dot F-R-A-Z-I-E-R at nasa.gov. And we'll hope you, we hope that you'll tune in for the launch, um, targeted for no earlier than June 6th. So the launch will be covered live on NASA TV. Um, so please keep an eye out on nasa.gov slash live for details on how to watch. We'll add that information as we get closer to the launch date. And thank you all very much. That concludes today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may disconnect at this time.